Thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. I'm Nick. That's Eddie. Eddie, say hi to everybody. We're from MassMutual. We're going to tell you about uh, a record linkage system that we built at MassMutual using Apache Spark, Python 3, and machine learning. So what's the business problem? Um, well, MassMutual and many other companies, I'm sure, uh, want a comprehensive view of their customers uh, or even potential customers. Well, why do they want that? Well, at least uh, in, in terms of uh, this project, they were most interested in that for marketing purposes and underwriting. So marketing, if I have more information about a person, I can market to them more effectively and sell them products better. Uh, for underwriting, MassMutual is a life insurance company. Uh, if we have a more complete picture of the people we're dealing with, we can underwrite their insurance policy more effectively and more quickly. <clears throat> so what's the problem? Well, the problem is that uh, the information that MassMutual already has in-house about its current and potential customers is scattered across a variety of systems that are owned or developed by various teams at various periods of time. And there is no global key linking them all together that tells you, hey, this is Eddie's information in this system. And by the way, here's Eddie's information in these 10 other systems. So now you can pull it all together and have the complete picture of Eddie. There's no such thing. And of course, we can't just simply do a, a, an equality join, like a, a naive equality join across all this stuff, because there are always variations in how a person's information is recorded variations in the name and the address particularly. So that's the business problem. What's the technical challenge here? Well, uh, we have around 330 million records about uh, customers, leads, other people, already internal to MassMutual. These, system, these records are scattered across a, a large variety of systems that have different schemas and so forth. Again, there's no global key. A very small percentage of these records might have the SSN, the social security number of those people available. And in theory, you could use that as a global identifier to link records across systems. But it's a really a small percentage of records that have that information available. And also, our current analytics infrastructure or pipeline does, is not capable of doing differential extracts of these source systems. These are live systems that are changing daily. Uh, so we have no way of, of saying every day, just give me the stuff that's changed or different. So if we want to do some kind of global record linkage within MassMutual's existing data assets, that means we have to pull in everything and do a global linkage across the whole thing every night. So that's the technical challenge. <clears throat> um, so some prior art I'll cover very quickly. Uh, in the record linkage area, there's a li Python library called ddupe. Uh, that actually has an associated uh, business or product uh, you know, that you can actually pay for. Uh, but the library, the core library is open source. Uh, it's a very mature and sophisticated library as far as I could tell. But I think, and I didn't look too deeply into this, this was actually researched by the team that came before me. Uh, all the processing that DDoop does is local. So the team that was evaluating this uh, library for this problem before I, I came along, found that basically it would not scale to the level that we needed. Uh, another piece of, of prior art is a system that was built in-house at MassMutual called Splinker 2. <clears throat> this system was built on top of uh, Apache Spark's RDD API in late 2015, uh, early 2016. And it had a bunch of problems. It took a really long time to run. Uh, it was not too stable, the code was difficult to maintain, and some people were not satisfied with the link quality. But building this system did prove, uh, as a kind of a successful experiment, that yes, we could do a kind of global record linkage uh, at scale, uh, but we just needed now to take the lessons from that and build something that was more production ready. So that's where Splinker 3 comes in, uh, an all-new system uh, that we built at MassMutual. And we targeted Spark's data frame API from the start. And the goal was to build a production-ready record linkage system and leverage all the lessons that we learned uh, from building Splinker 2. So before I, I go into the details of how we built Splinker 3 uh, and, and what it does, let's talk about record linkage in the abstract. What does it mean to do record linkage? What are the basic steps? So first, we start off with these varied and messy data sources that can all, each contain different bits of customer information, different schemas and structures. 
and we want to pull them all into one place and somehow standardize the structure so that everything's in a consistent format for us to work with. Once we have that, we want to generate pairs of people that we can then go and, and evaluate to say, are these two people the same person? How about these two people? And so forth. So we need some way of generating pairs of people to evaluate. And each, for each pair of people that we evaluate, we want to assign them a score, saying, yep, you're a match, or no, you're not a match. Yes, we think you're the same person, or you refer to the same person, or no. And once we have all that, the final step is to resolve transitive links. So I'll talk more about this later, but basically if record A got linked to record B and record B got linked to record C, but there's no direct link from A to C, we still want to recognize that A, B, and C are probably the same person. So we need some way of detecting these transitive links and taking the whole group as, as a whole and saying you are one person. So that's the whole kind of abstract design of record linkage. So let's look at, the each, at each individual step. Uh, first, standardizing the incoming data. I'm not gonna to spend too much time here, although I think there's a potential for like a whole separate talk on how, do you, how to handle uh, varied sources that you're ingesting and track the transformations required to standardize them. I think that could be an interesting talk. But I'll just, I'll just give a brief example here. Imagine you have one data set where the full name is represented as a column, uh, and another data set, the name is split into first name and last name. Or the zip in one data set is just the zip, but in another data set, it's the zip plus four. So we want to pull those into a single table and then standardize the structure so the fields are the same, the data inside the fields semantically has the same meaning. So that's step one. Step two is generating pairs. So we have all of our records pulled into one place, they have the same schema. Now we need to generate pairs of records to evaluate. And you might think, well, okay, that's a simple thing. You just take all of your records and just generate all possible pairs, right? The problem is when you have 330 million records, just naively generating all possible pairs to evaluate means you're gonna generate 10 to the 16 pairs. And that's just too much for, I think, any system to cost effectively evaluate, even, even Spark. So what we need is some kind of heuristic uh, a trick, uh, something, a shortcut to quickly cut down this 10 to the 16 generated pairs to something much more reasonable without losing too many real matches. The way we do this in Splinker 3, which is not novel, it's, it's, we, we took it from somewhere else, I'm pretty sure. Uh, other people have implemented similar ideas. By extracting a blocking key from each record. And what we do is we generate pairs only for records that share the same blocking key. I'll get, let me give you an example. Here's a record, John Roberts at 20 Main Street. And for, for the purposes of this example, my blocking key is the first letter of the, of the first name, the first letter of the last name, and the zip code. So that's the blocking key. And in this fashion, I extract the blocking key from each record. So for example, if I have another record like Jonathan Ray in the same zip code, this person has the same blocking key. So I would pair John Roberts and Jonathan Ray together and actually do a more detailed evaluation to see whether or not we think they're the same person or not. But if I had another record like Frank Sinatra at 07 whatever, obviously that person does not get the same blocking key, so I don't even generate a pair to evaluate in the first place. Now for the more data science oriented people uh, in the crowd, you can think of blocking uh, as sort of like a very crude model uh, or like a pre-processing model almost for, for predicting matches, where we want the model recall rate to be as close to 1.0 as possible, uh, but we don't particularly care about the model's precision. It's, it's okay if there are a lot of false positives in there. But above all, we want this crude model, this blocking, to cut down the search space drastically. And in the case of Splinker 3, the blocking key that we ended up using, which is very similar to the one I just showed you, basically cut down the number of generated pairs we have to process from 10 to the 16 down to 10 to the 8. Or to be more precise, from 330 million records, we got around 680 million pairs to evaluate in detail. All right, so that's generating pairs. And the great thing about working with Spark uh, is that implementing what I just described here, the blocking technique, the technique to generate pairs, um, is quite simple and elegant in the data frame API. 
So if I have a UDF that already captures the logic to extract a blocking key from a given record, it, and I have already a data frame of people, then I simply say people dot with column, and then I can append a new column onto my master data frame of people that has the blocking key attached onto the end. Great. Now to generate the pairs, I take this data frame of blocked people and simply join it to itself on the blocking key that I just extracted. And then I have a little bit here in the, in the where clause just to eliminate duplicate pairs so that if I have an A, B pair, I don't also generate a B, A pair. That's all. But that's it. And maybe to some of you, you're like, well, duh, uh, that's not that interesting. But to me, when I figured this out, I was like really, uh, I don't know, satisfied, uh, <laughs> you know, pleased. Uh, because it seemed really elegant, uh, a really elegant way of capturing the logic, a very clean uh, way of capturing what I was thinking in code. And I think that's part of the beauty of working with a declarative style API, like the data frame API. All right, so that's generating pairs. We've finished generating all the possible pairs of people we want to evaluate, and now we want to identify which pairs refer to the same person or not. So how do we do that? We have a, a logistic regression model uh, that does the evaluation. Uh, we train this model on the very small subset of records that we do have at MassMutual that do have the social security number. And so we use the SSN as the, the label, the, the, the true label of who's really the same person and who's not. And just a quick overview of the features of our model. Um, we compare the phonetic similarity of the name and the city. We compare the string distance of the name and the address in the city, and we also do exact matches on the state and the zip. Now, the details of the features we extracted are not important. I just want to show you kind of the structure of how we approach the problem. And this is not exciting or novel. I don't think it's even the best way to do this, but that's what we have, more or less. <clears throat> and a quick shout out to a very useful Python library that we, we leverage to uh, get access to phonetic encoding algorithms like Metaphone or Soundex and string distance algorithms like Jaro Winkler and Levenstein. Uh, these were very nice to have available in this one Python library called Jellyfish. All right, so here's a, just an example just to show you some sample data. Uh, you know, John Jones and Jonathan Jones with the, roughly the same address, we would mark them as a match. But John Jones and John Jones with a different street address, we would say, nope, we don't think they're the same person. And of course, John Jones and Janet Jackson, definitely not the same person, even though they may have gotten blocked together. So we've gotten all the records in a unified way. We've generated the pairs. We've, went, we've evaluated each pair and said, you're the same person. No, you're not the same person. The final step is resolving the transitive links. So I kind of briefly introduced this. Let's recap. Imagine I have three records. They got linked in this way. But if I look at each link in an isolated way and say, I'm going to give you your own global ID, I'm not really solving the problem, which is I want a global view of everybody who got linked together. And I want all of them to get a single ID. So if these three people got linked together, I want them all to have one ID, because I basically want to identify them as the same person. So what I really want is instead of having a group ID, a global ID one and a global ID two, what I really want is all of them to be recognized as the same John or Jonathan. Another great thing about working with Apache Spark is having access to some amazing libraries. And so doing this, solving this problem, is actually really simple with a package called GraphFrames, which I believe Dave Ricks authored, and it's open source. Uh, the problem I described is, is, I think, already well known and well solved in the field of graph uh, algorithms. Um, and the, the relevant algorithm is called connected components. The three nodes that were linked together and are kind of like an isolated island are a connected component. So if I just feed in two data frames, one data frame of vertices representing each record, another data frame of edges representing the links where we said, yep, these two people are a match, I feed those in and I just call connected components and voila. I have the results and I have a data frame that comes back to me with a person and then their global ID. It's beautiful. So when we launched Splinker 3, <coughs> We were immediately able to cut down the runtime of this global linkage job from over eight hours with the previous system to about an hour and a half. 
Uh, the simple, relatively simple, uh, pretty simple logis logistic regression model that we wrote did better than the previous systems. Uh, the code base was a lot easier to read and, in my opinion, to maintain as well, thanks in large part to the data frame API and this declarative style of writing the, the, the major transformations. And finally, there was just simply le uh, like less code weight, you know, less stuff hanging around our necks because we're able to leverage these the Spark and Python ecosystems. Now, since launch, and more recently, Eddie uh, has taken the lead on some experiments uh, with neural networks, trying to see if we can make things, make Splinker even better. And this was kind of prompted by an idea that was shared actually by uh, somebody from Riot Games at the previous year's uh, Spark Summit, uh, talking about how they use Spark to detect abusive language in, the, in their game. And so the goal of the, of the experiment was to see if we could, using neural networks, handle the edge cases better than the logistic regression model, and at the same time, simplify the code that we had to write, reduce the number of features we had to manually come up with and tinker with, uh, while still getting good results. So we experimented with convolutional neural networks, and uh, the model was trained on the raw text. So unlike where I, what I described earlier with, logi with the logistic regression model where I listed a bunch of features we were extracting, this model was just looking at literally the raw text. And we said, well, maybe this thing can learn all the same features uh, without us having to manually code up uh, anything related to features. Uh, we used Keras uh, to, to train this, this neural network. And some minor hacking uh, was required that Eddie had to you know, trudge through to get this model to play well with Spark. And maybe as part of Project Hydrogen that we heard about uh, this morning from Reynolds, maybe this will become easier uh, in the future. So results, um, we found using this uh, approach that we, we were able to increase the accuracy of the model at the expense of precision. Um, but we did not find that and this neural network model, uh, in the brief time that we had uh, you know, doing these experiments, we didn't find that it learned anything that was not already captured by the relatively simple logistic regression model. And even though we were able to cut out all the manual feature extraction, uh, that came at the expense of the interpretability of the model results, memory requirements, uh, and runtime. So uh, to step back, let's talk to talk about the biggest hurdles in, in building Splinker 3. So I just talked about kind of the implementation, uh, but I glossed over a lot of the, uh, uh, the pain uh, in getting there. So let's talk about the pain. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the training data that we had um, basically had very poor labels. Honestly, using the SSN as the label is uh, not a great, not a high quality way of getting good training data. At least we found it at Mass Mutual. Um, SSNs, they have typos, uh, family members use each other's SSNs depending on who's buying the policy for whom. Um, it was just not, not uh, a, a totally reliable way. Um, and it really limited the potential uh, for making kind of clear cut improvements to Splinker because we were always hobbled by the training data not being uh, high quality. We did a bunch of manual cleanup uh, you know, to try to improve uh, our training data. But honestly, in retrospect, I think if we had invested more time in turking, uh, basically farming out the labeling process to humans, or generating synthetic training data, it might have been worth, it probably would have been worth the upfront investment to just have a higher quality training data set. Another big set of, of hurdles in building Splinker 3 were uh, the numerous bugs and gaps in the API at least when Splinker 3 was developed, which was right around, uh, soon after uh, Spark 2.0 was launched. This was late 2016, early 2017. Um, I'll just list a few of them here. Uh, bugs related to code generation, bugs related to Python UDFs not playing well with the Spark optimizer. Graph frames at one point was not even compatible with Python 3, so we had to, when we got to the uh, uh, link, um, uh, transitive link resolution stage, we had to write all our results to disk so that we could just load them back from a Python 2 only program. Uh, but by far the most terrifying bug that I have ever seen and that really like hit me like right in the gut was the graph frames correctness bug. And, 
And this way, you can see, you can go click on these links when we upload the slides, or you can go find this, I reported this, and there was a long discussion afterwards. But basically, under certain circumstances, graph frames would take 80% of the records you fed it and give them all the same global ID. So they all got linked together, they're all the same person. And it was, a, it was just a killer because it would not show up when I tested locally, it would not show up on small bits of data, but only on the cluster, only at scale, only when you have to wait like an hour and a half for it to run to get the result that, oh shit, you know, it's broken. And you can read the story on GitHub, it's fascinating. Uh, it's related to, I think, some internal function, having kind of non-deterministic behavior and re reusing partition IDs, and that, that somehow gave us this, you know, abortion. Um, all these problems have since been fixed, right? Uh, but, you know, at the time, we really had to kind of push uh, through these, work around them, post on the mailing list, post on Stack Overflow, uh, stay up late, yada, yada. All right, so uh, final uh, takeaways uh, from the whole uh, uh, saga. I, th I would say overall, and I think Eddie would agree, uh, Spark makes building a, a scalable pipeline like this, a linkage pipeline, approachable, even for a machine learning newbie like myself. When I started working on Splinker 3, I didn't even know what logistic regression was. And it was really easy to just read a guide, read the docs, and get started, especially with logistic regression, which is probably the simplest machine learning technique you could start with. Um, the declarative style of the data frame API, I think, is great, fantastic, and it really facilitates good design, clean code. Uh, having access to the Spark and Python ecosystems overall is great. It's a great boon. It saves time. It, lets you outsource, basically, complexity to these libraries. At the same time, uh, good training data is really critical, and it's worth the upfront investment. Uh, a lot of the, the time we spent evaluating uh, Splinker's performance was, was spent kind of comparing it and doing detailed diffs of Splinker 3 against Splinker 2 and other internal systems we had, because we couldn't just run Splinker against some holdout set and say, yep, precision, recall, look good, wipe our hands and walk away. Uh, it was not that simple. And speaking of that, the, that problem of training data, um, in retrospect, perhaps it would have been smarter for us to focus only on the scalability problem and avoid the machine learning problem by just coding up some simple heuristics to start before then attacking on the machine learning. And I think that would have worked in our case, uh, for our use cases. And uh, later on, we, we all stumbled upon Google's ML engineering guide. And rule number one in their guide is you don't have to use machine learning. It's better to use simple heuristics uh, than to dive into machine learning right off the bat. And I totally agree with that rule. No wonder it's rule number one. Uh, and finally, like I just went over the bugs earlier, building with cutting edge tools uh, comes with risk. You get all the, sh the new shiny stuff, but you're going to cut yourself. So be prepared for that. I mean, 2.0 is not cutting edge anymore. We're at 2.3 now. Uh, and if you're not using the latest uh, and greatest, you're reducing your risk. But if you are, you need to be prepared for the, the extra hours spent debugging and reaching out for help and posting online and you know, writing up a short reproductions of the bug that you found so that somebody else can help you. And so that's it. I'd like to give a few brief shout outs to uh, Randall Schwager, Adam Fox, Grace Yu, and the folks at the in the data engineering and data science teams uh, at Mass Mutual. And with that, Eddie and I will take your questions. Thanks again, Nick and Eddie. That was fascinating. Any, any questions out there? Um, do you mind uh, dive deep into the how you integrate Keras with Spark? Sure, yeah, so the training of Keras we just did locally, not on Spark, so no distributed training there. Uh, in terms of uh, deploying Spark for scoring, we relied, again, on the Python UDFs, but we did run into a problem with the serialization of the model. So Keras models are not um, natively uh, pickleable, which is a problem for Python UDFs, so we ended up just writing a wrapper class that had its own serialization method that we wrote, taking advantage of different ways of serializing Keras models and use that for pickling. Um, and then it could be broadcast uh, to the cluster and used, you know, call predict within a Python UDF. Anyone else? No. So uh, that is this process of uh, identifying the pairs 
where you talked about the block, the first name, last name and zip. Mm -hmm. Initially you had uh, 10 power something and then obviously that would have reduced. So how, how did you, you know, uh, what was the scale of that in terms of uh, the process that identifies those, forms those pairs? And how did you have, uh, can you talk about the engineering you had to do with uh, the first name, last name and zip or just first name, last name and things like that? So are you asking how did we select the blocking key that we selected? Right. I mean, did you have to do any kind of engineering there or add more things to it like even the first part of SSN and things like that or? No. So the, so the example blocking key I showed you is very similar to the blocking key that we actually used. So to give a bit more detail there, the blocking key we actually, let me, uh, let me just go back here. This is the, the first time I'm actually using this, this touch bar for, for something actually useful. Was it uh, here? Yes. No, here. Okay. That. So the blocking key we actually use is almost identical to this, except instead of using the, the letter, the first letter of the first name and the first letter of the last name, we were using the first couple of sounds. So we would encode the name using Metaphone and then take the first sound or first two sounds from the first name and last name. How did we select that? It was a bunch of experimentation, you know, looking at... Uh, uh, our training data and how many actual matches we were missing or not missing using that blocking key. So there, were, there was no kind of uh, framework, rigorous framework for selecting it. It was a lot of experimentation and we also had many discussions about picking different blocking keys, picking a combination of blocking keys and using them together, but that's all just been kind of discussions at this point. Did that answer your question? Okay. Got a couple more. Mm -hmm. Hey, first of all, thank you. That was a really good presentation. Thank you. Um, did you ever um, or ever need to take, you said you had multiple different sources. Did you ever take those and score those or consider those into your inputs here? So uh, the sources we pull in and then kind of unify in, into a single data frame of all people and from there generate the pairs. So when you say that, did we score the sources themselves? Uh, well, the sources are just sources. The goal is to kind of make linkages across sources to try to find information that's for the same person but somehow was scattered across different data sets. Does that answer your question? Well, I, I could add to that. Oh, okay. Uh, I have a question, but in, in like real world scenario, mm -hmm. Right, yeah, we did not have a, a, a notion of source quality. Uh, I mean, we, there was a subset of the sources that we used for training, right, where the SSN was available. But apart from that, we did not make any discriminations on like ranking of the sources or quality of the sources. And also, the set of fields that we looked at was quite limited, because you're right, there are so many additional fields that you could use if, were, if they were available, like email address, let's say, um, or gender, or something else. Uh, and there's, so there's a lot of room here for tinkering and experimentation, and we didn't really go much further than full name and full address. Well, I was just going to add that, um, I, like Nick just said, yeah, uh, none of the features, did, it gave indication of what source it came from, which could have been a valuable thing to add. I think that's what you're getting at, right? A feature of the model could be, what source did I come from? But uh, we didn't try that. Um, just adding on top of that, uh, mm -hmm. once you got two models that you identified, or, or two uh, you know, persons that you identified were the same person, um, let's say they had differing uh, email addresses, how did you then do that conflict resolution of the individual fields? So if they have very completely different addresses? Right, so this is, so if they were off by a letter, uh, we would expect that the logistic regression model would learn that being off by a letter is okay because the training data had some of this natural variation where the two records would be almost the same, but there would be some minor differences. And that was part of the training process. I mean, which one would we keep? Oh, which one would we keep? Ah, so we did not, that's a very good question because many record linkage systems have a notion of a golden record, right? Uh, where, which is ba basically one of the records that got linked they would say, this is the golden record. Or they would merge them together and say, we've generated a synthetic golden record for you. Splinker does not do any of that. 
It just says these are linked together, and it does not have any notion of golden records. Operationally, how do you handle false positives? So the use cases that we're using Splinker for uh, uh, are relatively tolerant of false positives. Um, now, especially the marketing use cases, not so much the underwriting. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, so to give more, more, more context about how Splinker is being used at Mass Mutual, um, so we have a, a big kind of platform or, or lake where all these sources are being ingested. And Splinker is basically going through them every night and then generating these global IDs and sticking them in a table for people to use. And people know, kind of we've, we've made clear the messaging around Splinker, uh, that it's not guaranteed linkage. It's not to be used as like a, a kind of wham bam, you know, this is, this is exactly the same person. But it's meant to be a guide. It's meant to be a tool that you can use in some arbitrary pipeline that you're going to build that we're not aware of. You know, there's so many different people building different applications on top of the data. So if people do find false positives, uh, there is no kind of strong feedback loop where they come back to us and say, hey, Splinker, link these incorrectly. You know, find a way to fix that. Of course, if that was happening as a trend, then we'd have to go back and probably train a new model. But overall, we're quite tolerant of, of that kind of problem. And in the case of the logistic regression model, we also have a tunable threshold we can set right, uh, about where the binary classification is going to be, positive or negative. So you can actually start changing the threshold there and asking for um, you know, higher precision at the expense of recall. But it will never hey, be perfect. Thanks again to Nick and Eddie. We have a coffee break now, so you may be able to grab them if you have additional questions. Thank you. Thank you.